Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar introducing DevExpress Universal Windows Platform Controls presented by DevExpress CTO Julian Bucknell and DevExpress Technical Evangelist Paul Usher. The next version of Windows promises to stir up the development arena, compile your app and it will run on any Windows 10 device. First though, you'll need a professional, efficient, intuitive user interface. In this session, Paul and Julian will show off code with and use the new DevExpress UI controls for universal apps. Thank you for joining us. I will now hand things over to Paul and Julian. Thanks, Amanda, and good morning, everyone. Julian, are you with me? Absolutely, of course I'm with you. July has been a very interesting month. Obviously, Visual Studio 2015 was released, and about a week or so later, Microsoft released Windows 10. So there's a lot been going on. How's your experience with your upgrades gone? So it's, shall we say, it's been interesting. It's been very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it's been downright scary. Um, obviously, Windows 10 is still being um, released, as it were. Um, they're doing it in waves. Um, yesterday, for example, on my main machine here, I got notification that I could uh, update to Windows 10. And that was just yesterday, yet on the first day, I was able to update my laptop. So I'm not quite sure what kind of criteria they're using for deciding who gets Windows 10 and when they get it. Um, but the other interesting thing was, um, you know, they, they released Visual Studio 2015, so everybody jumps on and installs Windows 2015. And then when they release Windows 10, they also, same day, release the tools for developing universal Windows platform apps. And um, that, this staggered you know, release cycle, has been somewhat interesting. Um, to I'm say sure the we'll, least. Yeah, I'm sure we'll touch on it throughout this webinar, but it has been interesting and scary. Um, <laughs> but we're here, we're ready. You mentioned there, um, from what I heard, the release cycle of Windows 10 has actually been based on machine performance. So those machines that were um, deemed to be ready for the upgrade were got, received it first. So in your right. case, you know that you had the same email address across your devices. Right. Right. But your older laptop, uh, the brick, has... <laughs> hey, come on. I, I used to be able to carry this thing around. <laughs> now, of course, with, with the release of Visual Studio 2015, uh, if people haven't been to our website for a little while, we are including full support for VS 2015 in our 15.1 range. Absolutely. On the day that um, Microsoft released Visual Studio 2015, we also released our support uh, in version 15.1. It was 15.1.5, I seem to remember, as well as 14.2, if you're still back on um, uh, that particular release. So we released same day, full support for Visual Studio 2015 across the range of our controls, all the way from Windows Forms uh, ASP.NET, WPF, as well as uh, DevExtreme. So um, you have no excuses if you're absolutely to not use, uh, Visual Studio 2015. And I, I add, we also support uh, the Community Edition as well. So it's not just the Pro and Enterprise Editions. Uh, we do support nice. Visual Studio Community. So enjoy. Uh, I've got to say, I've been running VS 2015 since some of the betas and certainly now in, in production, and I really do enjoy the experience, and it's nice that our controls have been working in it for a while but are now fully supported. And, of course, that also means that people can access Code Rush for Roslyn. Absolutely. This is, if you haven't heard, uh, what we decided to do with Visual Studio 2015 and .NET 4.6 and... Uh, .NET 5, obviously, is to take Code Rush, um, take out all of our compiler code and use Roslyn instead. Now, Roslyn is the open source uh, compiler for C Sharp and BB written in C Sharp. Um, and the reason for doing this is normal Code Rush you know, compiles your project, basically, in the background, uh, builds up its own 
uh, abstract syntax trees and its own structures for allowing you to do uh, refactorings and all the other kind of cool things that happen within CodeRush. Uh, by using Roslyn, which is what Visual Studio 2015 uses, um, we are taking out one whole compiler step. Um, so CodeRush for Roslyn is a lot faster than CodeRush was or any other tool that uses its own compiler technology. Um, we are using what is there inside Visual Studio 2015, what Visual Studio itself is using. So we can basically tap into their abstract, abstract syntax trees. We can you know, discover refactorings through their, um, their structures. Um, we don't have to do that ourselves. So CodeRush for Roslyn is a huge work in progress. Um, I think we have around about 50 refactorings converted already. Um, so it's out there for preview. Uh, normal CodeRush is still there, uh, but uh, do try out uh, CodeRush for Roslyn and see what you think and uh, let us know. Very good. I suppose we should get on and talk about universal Windows controls or platform and since people didn't come to listen to us spruik about CodeRush. <laughs> no, we should talk about UWP or universal Windows platform. Ooh. So, I'm going to start by taking a bit of a dive into Windows universal apps and first of all, a little bit of history, I suppose, because Windows 8 actually brought us the Windows Runtime, or WinRT, and that was an evolution of the traditional Windows app mode, and then when Windows 8.1 was released, it created an alignment between the phone and the desktop, and this brought along a notion that you could create a universal app, therefore sharing a code base. Well, Windows 10 builds on that again and brings in this universal Windows platform or UWP and it allows multiple devices to use the same unified core, the Windows 10 core. And this is going to provide the common platform to allow you to target all those different types of devices that would run Windows 10. But the word universal, certainly in my opinion, I think is a little bit misleading or misrepresented because it is only going to refer to devices of running Windows 10. It doesn't cover things like iOS or Android. So universal is, you know, I think it's a bit of an overkill. What type of devices are we talking about? Well, there's the humble PC, the phone, tablets, Xbox, things like HoloLens, the Raspberry Pi, just to name a few. And it's about those machines having that common set of APIs allowing you to target them really, really easily. We can see here from this slide that, we, that Microsoft have introduced an adaptive user interface, which makes it a lot nicer or a lot simpler for you to target multiple devices. You've got this natural user input. The concept of one SDK and tools allowing you to combine a lot of what would have been multiple projects previously. And of course, incorporating that into things like the Windows Store and having this one store concept. Now, Julian, the, the idea behind these universal apps is really to be targeting Windows Store. Absolutely. Um, the plan is, just like in Windows 8, uh, is to be able to release an app, um, have it for sale in one particular place, the, the Windows Store and you know, allow your end users to basically buy it or download it from that store. Um, I'm, personally, I'm not sure about you know, what the pricing contract is like or anything like that, so uh, that is the theory behind it. I do believe you can also add, quote, ordinary Windows apps to the store as well, but in, in general, it's uh, targeted towards um, universal apps, and if you think about, you know, the news you've heard, um, or the rumors, or whatever you like about uh, Windows 10, things like um, was it Solitaire, for example? You can down. It's not actually part of Windows 10, but you can download it from the store uh, for free. But it comes with ads, or you pay for it, and the ads go away. Um, so the Windows Store is obviously the the place for putting your apps. Uh, you don't have to use it. You can. 
um, and and presumably at that point um, you can then download it on any of these devices which produces its own problems. Now, one thing that I'd, I'd find interesting and people could probably use the questions window to throw some ideas, you and I were talking about this earlier as to what sort of applications you think you could write that would target multiple devices in that sense? Indeed, the, the issue is, I mean, okay, PC and Xbox, uh, roughly the same high screen and all the rest of it, but Xbox has a certain different set of functionality associated with it, which is not part of what a PC is. I'd uh, even argue so demographic. Demographic? Yeah. In what sense? Well, I don't see I don't see my mum or dad sitting there with the Xbox going, <laughs> oh, I can't wait till this app comes out. <laughs> it's it's certainly going to be although the, all right, let's put it like this. Although the infrastructure is there now, um, or will be there the, towards the end of the year, um, what kind of applications are you going to be able to write that are going to be able to target all of these different devices? And as Paul and I were you know, chatting away earlier on this morning, um, we were basically saying it's going to be people will target one particular device even though it's a universal app. Um, so I imagine, for example, if you have one of those fitness bands, you'd write a, an app for your mobile, uh, your phone, for example, so that you can go running with your fitness band plus your phone to record all the information as you're doing the run. Um, yeah, you wouldn't be running around with your Xbox, which is obviously not portable and things like that. So it's it's one of those things um, we're kind of divorced from, you know, finished products in a sense, uh, finished apps. You know, we're, we're providing at Dev Express the controls so that you, um, our listeners, can create um, apps. And so we're just kind of wondering whether, you know, you out there, have ideas which would, you know, target the universality of these apps, or whether you would just still just target a PC. I do uh, like the idea of heading back from the gym and having my Windows phone send a message to my Raspberry Pi hooked up to my toaster to start cooking the toast. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just going for the Surface Hub myself, so there we go. You can, <laughs> Company you can expense deal with account. Your Raspberry Pi. I'll just have the Surface Hub, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, it, it does open up some other considerations, such as when you're actually developing these apps and you're targeting multiple platforms, and it's the same conundrum we have in the mobile arena. So, what do you think are some of the considerations to take into account when developing for multiple devices like this? Well, obviously, the first one is is the form factor. the The size of the screen is just different. Um, we're all used to using a PC, and the screen is nice, wide screen, and all the rest of it. But on the phone, yeah, we have this this kind of issue where most people use their phones in a portrait mode uh, rather than landscape, and uh, you can't fit as much information on it. So there is that the whole problem of the form factor is going to decide what you display and what you are actually going to present um, to your user. And over the past few years, uh, it seems to come about that you know the PC version of an application tends to have all of the functionality, for example, whereas the mobile is very restricted in the kind of information that it shows, the kind of information that it gathers, and so on and so forth. So the form factor is obviously the, the biggest thing here. Um, and the next thing is, you know, the various devices that you're going to be targeting. Um, yeah, I keep going back to the old PC, but on the mobile side of things, you, your device may be you know, a large phone or it may be a tablet, for example. Um, IoT, um, Internet of Things, um, that's a whole thing to itself, but the devices you're going to be running on are also going to dictate, to a certain extent, how you're going to develop these um, universal apps if you're going to be targeting multiple of, um, devices. And with regard to mobile especially, um, there is always these fabulous 
um, features that you have on your phone, you know, like GPS, uh, um, the ability to um, you know, there's um, you know, Bluetooth and all that kind of stuff. The um, the features that you have on the device itself. Now, obviously, those kind of features are not necessarily there on the PC side of things. Um, so, if you're going to be targeting, um, you know, mobile and PC, what kind of features are you going to be targeting? Hardware features you're going to be targeting on the on the mobile side versus the PC side and things like that. Um, Xbox is yet yet another kind of unknown, if you like. Um, I don't have an Xbox, I know Paul does, but, uh, you know, it's a static device. It's there in the corner, it's attached to your TV, and it has other features that you may be wanting to target and so on. And, you know, once you, once you start targeting multiple devices and multiple form factors and all that kind of stuff, you, you might run into the issue of, well, I'd really like my my user to be using, say, his phone. Uh, he puts his phone away when he gets to his desk, opens up his PC, and he's back right at the place where he left off on the phone. That kind of feature is a really nice to have, um, but it involves its own set of problems, its own set of scenarios that you have to work through. And uh, so letting users pick up where they kind of left off um, you know, as they move from device to device to device, is uh, an interesting question that we really haven't had to deal with in um, in writing applications uh, before. Fair points. So f form factors, the type of devices you want to target, uh, hardware specific features, and things like handoff, so that I can right. just continue working on what I want regardless. And uh, the other thing is about handoff is if you're handing off, say, from your phone to your, your PC, the PC can you know, visualize a lot more data and present a lot more um, information to you. So there might be some um, other feature there where you're talking about the ability to you know, aggregate your data from you know, several mobile devices or something like that. It's it's kind of a an interesting problem. Um, so, so I'm I'm just picturing Minority Report right now. <laughs> okay, you're standing up, waving your arms around again. Oh, <laughs> That's what I do best. <laughs> now, and and, and um, my Xbox is actually in the carry case. It goes everywhere with me. Oh really? Oh okay. There we go. Has a little screen that goes with it. Now, what's new for developers in Windows 10 then? So, there's a about well, over 300 items that I could find just in some of the research we were doing. And I'm not going to sit here and read all those out. So instead, I've picked out some of the key elements that I thought were really, really cool and belong to the whole UWP concept. There's this principle of adaptive layouts. So with Windows 10, the UWP can have multiple XAML views for one code base. Now, that's really exciting in that it means I can really focus just on one class behind and then depending on the device as to which of the views will be implemented. There's state triggers or visual state trigger. Now, this will allow you to conditionally set properties based on height or width or custom triggers. So as the state of your device changes, you can do other things rotations, um, moving between devices. There's a number of improvements inside the XAML engine. You can now do compiler-based bindings, which provides a much faster way of, of doing your bindings and also provides compile time errors. There's deferred loading of UI elements. There's a new library being introduced for dealing with um, keyboard input or uh, a single server input for, uh, what's the word, I'm, how do I describe it? Centralized processing of keyboard input. There's some new Cortana integration. There's extra device support for things like the, the um, hub that Julian is going to put on his expense account, I've heard. <laughs> and there's just so much more happening that Microsoft have, have brought in. But of course, the interesting thing with all that is it's not ready. As Julian said at the beginning, we're, we've only just been given Windows 10 for our PCs. Windows Phone, still not available. I'm running a preview on my 
how do you say it? Julian Nokia Lumia? Lumia, yeah. <laughs> and um, and it, it's it's going to be out soon, but it's still not released to the public. The Xbox, we're hearing dates of November for the Windows 10 to hit the Xbox, and other devices, we just don't know. And there's a certain set of inherent problems, certainly for our engineering team, who do a stellar job in the background, that they're working on pre-release software themselves. So up until just over a week ago, we were working with beta builds of Windows, beta builds of Visual Studio, beta builds of the tools. And the problem with that is that every time a new version comes out of one of them, it breaks something else. So it's really hard from a, a vendor point of view to be developing this software and making it so that it is cutting edge when we're dealing with pre-release. Absolutely, and that goes back to what you were saying earlier on about July being an interesting month. I, and per personally, I don't understand why VS then Windows. It's it, it's like yeah. for a week we're all hanging out saying, activate my Windows, please. <laughs> now, there are some prerequisites for getting started developing universal Windows platform apps. I do apologize if some of these seem rather obvious, but you must be running Windows 10. UWP applies to Windows 10. Don't be writing to us asking if we will support Windows 8. No, can't be done. It's the Windows 10 core, not the Windows 10 core with backwards compatibility. You must install the universal Windows platform tools inside Visual Studio and you must enable developer mode. Using Windows 10, pretty obvious, you can tell what your operating system is. Installing universal Windows app development tools inside Visual Studio. If you were to go and modify your Visual Studio installer right now, or install from scratch, you will see this entry appear inside the development features. You would need to tick and say, yes, I want UWP, please. And then the final uh, one there. I Sorry? just like to point out that remember Visual Studio 2015 came out uh, eight days before Windows 10, and it did not have this option in it. It was only when Windows 10 appeared that they added this particular option to the install for Visual Studio 2015. So if you installed, you know, two weeks ago you will not have the tools inside Visual Studio. You have to go back and modify um, Visual Studio. You know, let's run the installer again, click modify, and these, or these options will suddenly appear. So be warned. And you get some interesting issues if you try and open sample projects without them installed. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll move right on from that. Okay, <laughs> and finally... Now so that the final step with that is to actually set up the Windows developer mode. And to do that, it's as simple as hitting your start menu, clicking on settings, and then coming to the update and security option. I'll use my mouse, sorry, because that way you can see where I'm going. When this pops up, you'll notice on the left-hand side is a menu option that says for developers. And for some reason, it's not camel case. So maybe developers don't feature as much. Once you're inside this option, you need to select the developer mode. You'll receive a warning, but that has to be set before you can start working on universal apps as well. Otherwise, you will start seeing dialogues inside Visual Studio complaining. And with all that set, what we'll do is take a look at two apps that have been built by our team for Windows 10 Universal Platform. and then we'll step through how that looks inside Visual Studio. Okay. Now the first thing we want to show... Sorry? No, no, okay, go for it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we want to showcase is a desktop application. This is our Dev AV hybrid application and it's based around a fictitious audio visual company. Now, the look and feel of this is a little bit Microsoft dynamic CRM. We've got that nice tab strip across the top with the drop-down elements. And the really cool thing here is even if you're not, you're not running Windows in tablet mode, the whole thing has a nice touch-feel approach to it. So without using my mouse, I can come along and switch between these different elements. 
we can see some of the animations happening there as we page through the different modules. Now one thing that we didn't mention before, the initial cut of our Windows or Universal controls was a port from our WinRT versions and that's been able to be done relatively seamlessly notwithstanding the problems of those different versions and tools and debugging etc that went through. But it was a great chance to start with a lot of work that we'd done previously and then start adding controls to that. And we can see that we've got some nice interaction, we can look at our customers, we've got sales, as I drill in I can actually double click on a contact and bring up a contact record back to my all customers notice that go to webinar sometimes starts eating clicks and uh, other visual things but as a desktop application we've got lots of real estate we can see that nice uh, I want to use the word metro here but then Julian would fire me <laughs> view or feel of the the nice text boxes the large information all in your face easy to get to I can't believe I just said the word metro Julian oh no but uh, one thing I want to point out obviously if you're already using Windows 10 you already know this but uh, in Windows 8 this would be full screen as a metro application in Windows 10 it's just a normal window um, so it can be resized it's uh, you know you in the top right hand corner there you can see the minimize, maximize and close buttons and all that kind of stuff. So you can just use it as a normal Windows app. It doesn't look <coughs> horrendously different as it did on Windows 8. And as Paul goes through Easy. this and um, you know, shows some of the, the features here, notice the kind of controls that uh, we've already put into uh, the Universal Windows platform suite. Um, so we grids and the charting and um, now we're looking at editors and all that kind of stuff. And obviously being uh, Windows 10, it's, uh, it's all touch capable. Um, things are big, you know, for your finger and all that kind of, uh, um, those kind of features that you, you require in a, um, a hybrid app such as this is. And at this point I'm actually oops, just using my, um, my finger to control some of these elements. Um, and I'm finding the, the more I play around with laptops with touch screens, the more natural it feels to be using my finger as opposed to reaching for the mouse in a lot of senses. Um, so much so it's causing problems when I'm using my MacBook Pro. <laughs> there you're just streaking your screen without any real effect. Yeah. Maybe that's where Stangate came from. <laughs> so as far as the as far as the interface, really nice and clean. Excuse me while I uh, take a little drink here, I'm choking. Uh, really nice and clean on the interface, everything is interactive. So how would that translate then to the mobile device? Well it just so happens that if I minimize this, I have a mobile or Windows Phone emulator sitting here, running Windows 10, and I can jump into the hybrid app on the device. If I bring up the hamburger menu, I love that term, it doesn't look like a hamburger anymore, <laughs> but we can see, and what I'm going to do here is just put this at the back and then this to the front, so actually just so you can see some comparisons, use my Windows left key and there we go. All right, so what we're seeing, that same menu that we had the dynamics style CRM menu across the top has been translated into this easy to navigate Windows option. We're still using the same graphics, obviously inverted, but you've got that consistency. And that's something really important to when you're working with your multiple devices to stay consistent with your graphic assets. But this time I'm going to go to dashboard and 
I've got dashboard up on the left hand side. To start with, I can see my sales. I can scroll through, nice big text. Everything's formatted nicely. I can come across to revenues or cost of goods sold. We've got the, the charting coming through there as well. If I switch to tasks, and I'll do that on both, we can see again that real nice representation of the difference you can make between writing your view for a desktop XAML and your mobile XAML. In fact, that's I can bring up a task. That's an interesting point. On the, the PC side of things, we've got a normal style grid, rows and columns, but in the mobile version, what we're doing here, in essence, is we're creating um, a card layout of the grid. So each card is, um, you know, information for a particular element or row. And that's that's the kind of thing I was trying to get at earlier on, where um, these are kind of the considerations you have to consider, considerations you have to consider, hmm, uh, when you're building a universal app. You have to think of, you know, the different ways of presenting your information and we try and help you with that with our controls. Here we've got the same familiar feel, nice and easy to navigate, even if you've got big fingers, yeah. with the dialogue results coming through. So the employees, and again I'll just keep moving the, the left hand side to match the simulator unless you drag it off to the side. See, maybe my fingers are too big for the laptop screen. And we can see all the elements that I want to bring through. So as a simple example of what can be built, the hybrid app we ship the entire source code for. But as far as features that we are shipping in the control sets themselves, what I'm going to do is swap over and have a look at another example that we provide. And again, full source control is provided with all the samples. This one's called the feature demo. And if I go back on the left hand side, we can see my menu control or the main one. I'll just maximize this for a second. And one of the new controls that we've added to the suite is the ribbon. So Julian, tell us about the ribbon. So the ribbon is essentially um, taking the idea that Microsoft had when they were producing um, Office for um, the iPad, um, and that is to somehow shrink the ribbon into you know, its essential elements, if you like. And so the ribbon here is that uh, example basically made for a Windows 10 application. So it's like a main menu, but each of the uh, items in the main menu are not other menu items, but actual um, uh, ribbon items that you can use, but you know with a smaller uh, with a smaller footprint. Now, we saw some of the charting inside the AV application, but mm -hmm. you've got this really nice interactive. You should be seeing some of those animations come through, hopefully. Yes, they're I coming through nicely, yep. Yeah. Each of the elements. And, of course, if you've worked with any of our WPF controls or the XAML controls for Windows 8, you'd be used to some of this functionality already. If we take a look at that same thing inside the mobile now. Now the ribbon control hasn't been ported to mobile at this stage, so that's why I didn't show anything anything there. I'm going to jump into the features app. Wait for this to load up. Straight away, remembering that it's coming from the same code base, we're just using different XAML views. You can see what a rich difference you can make depending on the device type. How that orange black gradient and the, the large tiles really work with a mobile. So I'm going to activate the charts portion of it and I'll come into the dashboard. 
Julian, I can hear you typing. Yeah, I I do apologise. Let me let me mute myself as I answer questions in the background. No problem. So again, I've got the interaction on the charts now because. We're not showing everything on one page. We can't see what's happening beneath that. But simply by scrolling up the page, we can see the introduction of the other elements of the chart. So it still allows the user to have access to all the information that they want while keeping it inside a form factor that works for the phone. Another element inside charts would be something like the real-time data source. So I'll just jump into here and activate real-time data. Come back through my charts and do real-time data here. And we can see again that the point we're trying to get across here is that you're developing it once. You're simply using the XAML to lay it out in different ways for the different devices you want to hit. Now, as far as other controls and things that we've introduced, I think the mapping is definitely worth a mention. The shapefile support, so on my main desktop one, I can select my regions, I've got my pinch to zoom, obviously it makes it easy on a larger screen. I can quickly switch between my options, so political, population, GDP. How does that translate across to the mobile device? Well, you can see that we're still able to show the legend, slightly transparent, so it's not getting in the way. And I've got that pinch and zoom support as well. As far as the options, you've got the ability of tucking those away in the corner there, or bringing them forth and then activating them in this way. We can see that I can very quickly just swap between different things. Exactly the same functionality, just delivered visually in a slightly different way. Now, what's your favorite set of controls to show off, Julian? As I make him unmute himself. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> that was like talking to a microphone that wasn't switched on. Um, <laughs> um, for me, it's, um, it's all about um, data visualization and data presentation. So as you've got up here, you've got the, uh, the grid, uh, showing what the grid looks like on um, the, uh, the PC version, if you like, versus the emulated uh, mobile version. Um, my favorite for, you know, for this kind of um, you know, demo is obviously the more visual it is, the better it looks, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what are you looking at? Conditional formatting? Oh, data grouping. Oh, yeah, let's, let's have a look at data grouping. That's, uh, that's a good one, too. By the way, as I'm, as I'm talking, Paul, um, uh, somebody on the, uh, the questions um, Rick Mathers, Mathers um, wanted to have a look at what the hybrid app looks like as you resize it on the PC. So something, something we can look at in a moment. But here we're showing uh, our grouping facility both on the uh, PC side and on the mobile side um, and the way to um, uh, open up groups and, um, and resort uh, the uh, the columns and so on and so forth. I have no idea what I'm doing, by the way. I'm just dragging. Yeah, it looks from... looks pretty good. You know, you're grouping by sales and then year and month. That's something <laughs> that people do all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh boy. <clears throat> now what what I might do is just see what happens then when because it's not something I've I've not tried. Um, oh, don't hit power. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that would not be good. Uh, the hybrid. The hybrid uh, hybrid app uh, would become under H. There we go. We can find it. So at the moment it's, it, well, yeah, it's it's not quite full screen. It's uh, so just grab a corner and uh, resize and see what happens to, for example, in this particular case, the um, the cards. And obviously what happens is uh, we basically try and fill the space with cards, but we don't do partial cards. That's for the grid. Notice the way the side menu there disappeared um, and so on and so forth. The top menu um, gets a little scroll button, so you can scroll to all the, uh, the other items in that particular uh, dynamic um, 
uh, what do we call it? A tab menu or something like that? I can't remember. Um, so this is this is what I was trying to say earlier on. In Windows 8, no, you just have it full screen. Here in Windows 10, it looks more like a normal Windows app because, in essence, it is a normal Windows app running on a particular uh, runtime, but it's still a normal Windows app. You can do things like drag it to the top of the screen and it will make it full screen. You can do the... Um, you know, make it to one side or the other side, um, you know, using your Windows key or the mouse or whatever. It's, um, it's just a normal app. And we try with our controls to um, cater for the smaller screen as you resize it. Now, with the time picker, <clears throat> we've got the standard way of picking it as you're used to on your device, but one of the right. things that I love is the radial time editor. <laughs> okay, so this, this is very just... much a finger touch type thing. Absolutely. So if I want to move the seconds, I'm going to move the inner. If I want to do the minutes, I'm going to move the middle. And the hours would be the outer. So it's really quick to be able to select different times. Um, it, oops, in essence, it, I think in some cases faster than using the more traditional box approach. And of course I could switch between AM and PM really quickly there as well. Mm -hmm. Now, th there's so much as far as standard controls. It's the stuff that people have come to love DevExpress for. So all the types of editors you're going to want, the text boxes, the custom buttons, the combos, um, you name it from a, an editing point of view. But of course, we've also got things like the layout controls where you can build a layout by a particular design pattern. We've got the, the, the whole MVVM framework inside there as well. Um, here's just a quick example of, of building different message boxes, system message boxes using that MVVM approach. And they're simple things, simple. I, I say I use the word simple. I mean, anybody ever tried to build their own barcode? Um, there's support for barcodes and all sorts of things happening in there. I'd certainly recommend as soon as you can get hold of the demo version or the beta version of this and have a play around. See how the responsive layouts or adaptive layouts work and what you can actually do with them. And that was a great question and thank you that we got to show some of that other stuff off as well. I think but what's uh, it's time to look at Visual Studio. You took the words out of my mouth. How does all this look inside Visual Studio? Well, certainly one of the one of the negative points right now, Julian, is that you close the wrong window. Is the fact that the um, the XAML designer still seems to be a little bit iffy. So I'm not even going to attempt to open the designer itself. But what you'll notice. And I'm just picking on the feature demo. I've just come down to the editors um, folder. And what we can see is you have your standard XAML views. So straight under the folder, we've got these you know, button edit module.xaml. And then we've got the C sharp behind it, as you'd expect. What you'll notice inside the Solution Explorer, let's just pin that in place, is that you've got this other folder which represents the other device family devices that you might want to target. So in this case, we've got the device family of mobile. And if I extend, expand that out, we'll see that that becomes just the XAML for the mobile instance. The code behind is a shared code behind file. And that's one of the really nice things about this whole universal Windows platform approach. You would not have to have separate projects and just try and share a bit of code elsewhere. So in essence, you're changing the view without changing the code behind. Correct. And think about how cool the XAML approach is. Now, we, we've touched on this a couple of times. We've done a, a, a WPF session together. But that whole separation of concerns where you can have your UI 
separate it from your core logic or your business logic and simply by using triggers and binding you can have so many different visual ways of doing the same thing and this just expands on that to the level that it's going to allow that whole UWP approach. If so, I open up the... I'm sorry, go on. Well, if so, I open up the hybrid app, you'll, you'll see a typical construction of a well-produced application. We've got a common folder with our common behaviors and views and converters. We've got our data model happening here. And then as I scroll down, we're going to have our view models and then our views. So you could quite easily extend, say you've got an existing application that targets Windows 8 desktop and you want to bring it up to Windows 10 and then target mobile phone as well. It, if you've built it using this method with the, the, the idea of separated uh, concerns. your view model from your views, the separation concerns, then it's so much easier to implement. It could be late when Xbox gets the update, you go, oh wow, I can move my app to Xbox. Realistically, all you should be doing is creating the new XAML views for that particular device. Absolutely. So this is all um, an implementation of model view view model, uh, the MVVM framework essentially. And that's what um, um, the, the Windows 10, um, what am I trying to say here? And that's what is provided by Visual Studio essentially uh, to create your uh, your model with XAML. You create your models, your views, and your view models. My word, I think I need another cup of coffee. <clears throat> <laughs> Maybe a beer. <laughs> ah, <laughs> too early for that. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock somewhere in the world, Julian. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, the so with that in mind, it comes back to the whole emphasis that XAML should be your friend. And I think really whether you're looking at targeting just standalone desktop apps, you should be focused on WPF for the future, or you want to target universal applications, then you're still going to need that whole XAML approach. And I think having talked to a number of developers, that still causes some concern or reservations around what they're doing. It's like when you talk to people about JavaScript. Julian normally Sorry, goes, I was replying to the question. JavaScript. <laughs> How are the questions going? Because I'm going to jump to the almost the questions tab. Um, questions are going pretty well. Um, um, there's nothing really uh, well, here's one from Alain Fernandez, is how do you define the elements inside a XAML file for resizing? Not quite sure what the question means. Resizing the, the window, uh, maybe? Don't know. We also have our layout control to handle some of that as well. So right, yeah. depending on if the question is relating to how do I make it do certain things when it gets to a certain size, a lot yeah. of that comes in from the adaptive layout and the visual triggers or the visual state triggers that I was mentioning at the beginning as well. And there's one here so, saying, is there a, because you showed off the, the barcodes, is there a barcode scanning feature? And the answer is no. We do not have well, such a control. We don't have the control, but there is access to scanning barcodes within the, uh, the the framework. So it's not a Dev Express feature because it uses it just uses a camera and some oh, okay. abilities to decode that. And interestingly, I'm seeing more and more people looking to do barcode scanning on mobile devices. Uh, and of course, if you're talking cross-platform mobile, which I love. Then we've got Dev Extreme, and as I shared with you this morning, that's a sample project I've been playing with is using Dev Extreme to scan barcodes and retrieve assets from a web service. Ha! Okay. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. So where to, from, before we get to the, the rest of the questions, where to from here? Well, obviously the first... When are we going to have a beta version? <laughs> so the very first question is, when can I download this? Um, we're almost ready. Uh, we've been 
Uh, the team have been uh, making changes throughout the past uh, essentially week since uh, Windows 10 came out and the tools came out. Um, so we've been frantically working in the background, um, making sure everything works. Um, so the beta should be out within a week or maybe two. Um, so maybe by this time next week we might have a beta out. Um, I'm going to say now um, that it's probably going to be just for universal customers only. Um, this is going to be a brand new suite, um, so uh, it makes sense to give it to universal and maybe de experienced customers. Um, so beta, maybe a week's time, 10 days time, um, so around that region. I know the team want to release it immediately, but I think we still have a, a few little things we need to address before we do so. Well, I think as well the thing comes down there is you, at the moment you'd only be able to use it on your Windows 10 desktop or inside an, an emulator or simulator for your phone. There's no support for other devices from Microsoft yet. Correct. Um, obviously, if you've been um, getting Windows 10 uh, previews for your phone, um, you'll be able to download it onto your phone and actually use it on the physical device. Um, but remember, Windows 10 has only been released for PC devices at the moment. Um, mobile devices, I think, was like September, October. Um, I'd have to refer back to whichever rumor I was thinking of at the time. Uh, we were told only this week uh, that Xbox is November. So be aware that although we are showing you some of the, the mobile features here and our controls inside of mobile emulator, um, it's still the operating system for that is still in beta. Now, one thing I just wanted to point out is when you do get the tools and install them, you'd have your familiar DX entries inside your toolbox, so you could quite literally just drag and drop or double click and place that on your canvas. Right. So, we are at the mercy of Microsoft. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the tools have been out a week. Um, Windows 10 has been out a week. Um, already there's a big update for Windows 10 that's uh, going out right now. Um, so even if you haven't managed to install Windows 10 yet, there's already an update for it. So we're talking um, bleeding edge here, um, I'd have to say. Um, and Paul and I have basically sweated some blood this week to get to this point. Um, it's been interesting, let's put it like that. You know what they say, Julian? What's that? If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we're on the edge. We're not taking up any room at all. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that people should learn XAML. And you and I have spoken about it. We're going to do a series of XAML workshops in the very near future, which will be taking you through the simple guide get up to speed with XAML and how to use our XAML controls and our universal Windows uh, app controls and the, I suppose the, not the idiot's guide because that would mean that I think people are idiots, but the, the, the basic guide of moving from WinForms to WPF and the likes of that so that you can take your existing knowledge and translate it into what we believe to be the next generation of user interfaces which are all XAML based. The final thing here is that the we expect to be releasing a final version of the universal app controls before our 15.2 release, so before December. Now, if there's any change to that, Julian will be blogging on his site or the Dev Express site, and so watch that space as well. Yeah, exactly. Now, before this the chance to go, any last minute questions? Sorry, um, I just want to go back to that particular point. Um, what we're saying here is we're not going to be waiting till 15.2 um, to release um, the Universal Windows platform um, suite of controls. Um, it's almost ready. Um, what 
will happen is obviously as we learn more about, um, say, uh, the features and the API for um, Xbox, for example, uh, there'll be you know, minor releases um, uh, all the way up to 15.2 and so on. So this is going to be released within the next month, six weeks. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll be providing more information as we go along in the next uh, few days. I hate those chimes sometimes. Oops, I it's muted myself uh... to answer a question. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the power, go. yes, indeed. <laughs> so were there any, any questions we didn't get to, Julian? Um, hang on a minute. Did you answer Oops. the final one? <laughs> no, um, Victor actually produced a, um, a, a or asked a very good question here. He has D experience and Windows 8 XAML subscription today, and he's asking whether there's going to be an upgrade to the universal Windows platform um, controls for since Windows 8 is passe, as they say. Um, we haven't decided that yet, Victor. Um, it's one of those things that we have to discuss um, as a management team. You know, how are we going to migrate our users um, to uh, Windows 10 and to the universal Windows platform? Um, it's it's not decided yet, so don't don't worry. It's it's probably a common uh, question, and um, uh, we should have some answer within the next uh, week or so by the time we release the beta, for example. So we'll see. Excellent. Well, that's all I have, Julian. All right. Amanda. All right, guys. Thank you very <laughs> much. All right, everybody, check out devexpress.com slash webinars for all upcoming webinar sessions and to access previously recorded webinars. Today's webinar will also be available later on our DevExpress YouTube channel. I posted the link in the chat box. And that is it for this one. Thank you so much to Paul and Julian. Thank you all for joining us. And, of course, thank you for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.